Welcome back to the Muzzle Blast Podcast, the official podcast of the National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association. This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor Bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. This week on the podcast, we're talking with traditional craftsman Ian Pratt. Ian describes himself as a maker of unique iron mounted guns and accoutrements, and we're excited to have him on the show. If you like old flintlocks, nice knives, and nice accoutrements, you're going to really enjoy this show. Thank you so much for listening. Ian, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm on the right side of the dirt, so I can't complain too much. Well, that's important. So to jump into it a little bit, how long have you been doing what you do? And, and for people that don't follow you or don't know who you are, what's your primary focus of, of the work that you do? Um, it's as far as doing what I do, I've probably been doing it. I, you'll find if you, if you start asking me more questions about dates and numbers, <laughs> you'll find that I have a little trouble with that. I've been that way my whole life. I, I, uh, I mean, right now I can't tell you how old I am. I'd have to look at my driver's license and count. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, it's just like, now I can't tell you. It's just, it's just, just the way I am, but best estimate, uh, without going in the house and looking at numbers or something would be, uh, I've probably been doing this full time for close to 20 years. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I did it for, for a little bit before that mm -hmm. I kind of, after I just did it for a few years, uh, sort of part time, I was working construction at the time. And if work got slow in the winter time, I'd, I'd build a gun or two. Then I'd go out to friendship, try to sell them yeah. in the spring. And, uh, one year work got real slow. We were, most of us were laid off for like three months the one year and mm. I built a few guns and suddenly realized I had like a dozen orders, uh, from, from people for guns. And I just decided to jump in and sort of never went back. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, it's been great. Um, and as far as what what I do, uh, almost everything I've built, other than a couple of the early ones uh, that I did, has been iron-mounted guns. Uh, generally, uh, when, at least when I was getting started, they were guns based on or influ uh, inspired by guns of the South. Okay. Uh, the American South. Um, that's where the iron is in America. Yeah. And as far as the guns go and, uh, I've, I've, over time I've kind of branched out to where I'm, Oh, doing, doing all kinds of things, but still all iron mounted guns. Uh, but they're all flintlock, uh, you know, rifles and smooth bores of various descriptions. And, and, uh, this really the last few years just really been kind of doing my own thing with them. And I think that shows, I, I mean, you don't have many posts on your Instagram, but especially your recent stuff has just come out. And I mean, it's just really nice to look at. I encourage anybody listening to the show after we've, we've got it published here to check it out. Cause I mean, oh, thank you. the knives that you've been doing, it seems like you've been doing a lot of knives lately and they're the shape on them is just lovely. <laughs> well, you know that, uh, thanks again. And that's, uh, I've been, I've been doing knives since sometime in July. Normally I don't do a big run of knives like this, but I didn't, I didn't make any for around a year. And, uh, uh, you know, the orders just kept backing up and some people have been waiting a very long time. I made a couple, just a quick ones to sell at Lake Cumberland show in February, but that's really all the knives I've made in about a year. And I got into it. I was going to make like a dozen and try to get a little bit caught up on my list and just, I, it just snowballed. I just kind of kept going. And I've still got a couple to finish out here. Um, I've got one that I'm working on for a, a judge in New York that's just been eating me alive. I, I, <laughs> um, I just uh, it's I, I left a couple of the fancier ones here towards the end, you know, yeah. so I could spend a little more time with them. 
but I finally finally got that thing corralled to where it's making sense and 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 back on it in earnest. Uh, and then I'll be back into the gun work. But yeah, I didn't. I, I haven't been doing Instagram for too long, and uh, you know I intend to keep posting more. But um, you know, I, 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 I've uh, I can't remember how many knives I've put on there here recently. Probably a couple of dozen or yeah. Looking at not, it here, there's there's quite a few. It looks like you've been real busy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, always busy. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And, and, uh, you said interesting shapes. Um, a lot of my, uh, blade shapes, um, are kind of, um, variations on Herschel's houses style. If you, if, if, uh, if you look at them okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and compare not everything I do, uh, but, that's really where I got my start in, in actually making knives. I've always been interested in them, but as far as uh, forging blades and stuff, I got my start, learned, learned some stuff from um, Herschel and John House. And uh, it just kind of has stuck with me. And again, you know, as time's gone on, I'm kind of branching out and uh, trying other things. But it's such a such a neat style that they do. I mean, I don't think my stuff looks exactly like theirs. But No, not at all. Yeah, but it's but anyway, that's that's where a lot of it comes from as, as far as the blade shape. Yeah. So is that how did you I mean, Herschel, the, the house families is rather famous, I, I think, in, in this circle of of traditional craftspeople and muzzleloading just in general. How uh-huh. did you get to know those guys and then and then kind of study under them or, or, or follow their work? Well, um, I went to. Oh, one summer, I won't get into the whole story, but something happened at work where, you know, working and excavating, if you take time off in the summer, you lose your job. Uh (laughs) And, uh, something happened to where I was able to take a little bit of time off and, uh, we'll just kind of leave it at that. Uh And, and, uh, I, uh, I had for a long time had wanted to take some of the NMLRA sponsored classes at Western, uh, and, uh, never could because they're in the summer yeah well i was able to sign up for i took a lock building class with uh jim chambers and herschel's class was directly across the hall so i was i kept jumping up and running over there to see what was going on i was always really intrigued with uh, herschel's stuff and that's really where i met him and john and then i think the following winter uh was when i took a uh gun building class with them at Canner's Cave here in Ohio. Okay. And uh, kind of got to know him, and just over time got to be, it doesn't take long uh, to, uh, Herschel will be a friend about anybody, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, got to be friends with, with both of them, and uh, uh, just over time started going down there for visits every now and then, and, and of course you go down there, even for a visit, you're going to learn something, you know? They're yeah. just so willing to share whatever they know. Uh, so that's how that really all started. That's really um, cool. And so yeah. you, you got your start or started learning there. And now you're at the point where you're kind of branching out and, and trying a lot of your own things, but still kind of keeping true to that, that style. In a, yeah. In, that in a sense. I mean, I've, I've, I've kind of, uh, in the rifles, there's, I can still see a little bit of it every now and then, but, you know, I, I think I've kind of developed my own thing completely mm-hmm. on the guns. I mean, still train, staying true to uh, tradition in a certain sense, but I think what I come up with is something that's recognizable as my stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm seeing it through my eyes. I don't know. So what what are some of your other inspirations? I mean, I'm a sucker for iron mounted guns. I mean, I'm I live in well, northern Indiana, but I love <laughs> iron mounted guns. <laughs> They're yeah. not not exactly um period for this area, but what mm-hmm. other kind of influences are there? Are there, you know, it, you have the Kentucky rifles and then you kind of have the Lancaster and the Lehigh Valley rifles. Are there similar things f- you know, similar styles like that when it comes to Southern rifles or is oh, it just sure. kind of Southern guns? Um, no, I think, uh, years ago, they tended to be all grouped together for whatever reason there wasn't, uh, until more recently, there hadn't been, 
they hadn't been studied as academically, we'll say. Okay. And they were definitely uh, just as worthy as any other gun from any other region. And, uh, oh, in recent years, there's been some fantastic books come out. The one that comes to mind recent uh, uh, right away is, is uh, William Ivey's book on North Carolina long rifles, uh, where he breaks uh, a lot of those guns down into schools. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely worth checking out if you're, there's a lot of good iron mounted guns in there and brass, um, that a lot of people just aren't aware of or weren't aware of before his book came out. And there's some others. There's, uh, David Bird came out with a, a, a neat smaller book on East Tennessee rifles. It's, um, it's a, it's a small book, but it's got some neat history talks about, uh, how a lot of the gun makers sort of work together, um, in, in that region. Uh, anyway, there's, there's been more, uh, that's been made public, I guess we'll say that that's available to people yeah. who are interested in it now. So yeah, a lot, of, as far as the iron mounted guns, um, we don't, re- there's just a handful that are, that are thought to be pretty early, you know, colonial era. Um, and there's evidence of more of them, but not many. And, uh, you get towards the end of the 18th century on into the the 19th and they start popping all, up all over the place down there. Like we've got exist, existing examples to look at tons of them uh, from Southwestern part of Virginia into uh, Tennessee, North Carolina. And uh, a lot of those people took those, you know, those gun makers took their style and took the iron mounts with them when they moved on. I mean, some mm-hmm. uh, the Sheets family, a branch of them came up to uh, not far from where I live over to towards well, they called it Mad River area then around what Dayton is now. And you see some iron mounted guns, Ohio made rifles around there. Um, over in Indiana, uh, the first one that comes to mind there that was doing iron mounted rifles is Washington Hatfield. Um, there, Anyway, it's it kind of, you know, spread out over time. Yeah. Um, but the epicenter of it appears to be southwest Virginia. Hmm. Yeah. But there's 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 plenty of them. You just if you're going to shows to look for them, you just got to find out what the right shows are to go to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of uh, out. Yeah. There's a great show in uh, in Tennessee near Knoxville, usually every spring. Hopefully they'll be able to do it again in, in 2021, um, usually in April. Uh, just a ton of neat southern guns there. Um, uh, some of them show up at the CLA show. Uh, anyway, it's, they're, they're a little tougher to find still sometimes for some people, but they're out there now. Hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah. Do you know what, do you know what area the Washington Hatfield guns were built in here in Indiana? No. Um, I can't remember what County he was from. There's, I remember years ago, there was an article or a series of a couple articles on him in muzzle blast magazine. Okay. You might be able to go back and look, um, I can't remember what county he lived in, though. Oh, that's okay. That's right up my alley. I've got all those. Um, I've got all the all the back issues basically on a digital archive, so I can hunt that up for sure. Yeah. Oh, he did some really distinctive stuff. When you you know you see one of his rifles, you know it's one of his. Um, he he often would use mixed metal like forged mounts and maybe copper or brass pipes and uh, oh. pewter uh, poured pewter cap muzzle caps on some of them and. Uh, there's something about his side plate too is odd, like a arrow shape or I'm trying to picture it, but, but anyway, they're, they're pretty distinctive guns. So what draws you to those, to the iron mounted guns? Um, I, I guess, you know, I've, I've got an appreciation for, for any of these old long rifles and what it was about the, the iron uh, I mean, initially it's just the overall appearance of them. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just something about it appeals to me. Um, and it's, it's, it can be hard to figure out yeah. sometimes, you know, uh, but I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of them. Most of the American guns in, in comparison to the European iron mounted guns, iron with the iron mounted guns in Europe were oftentimes the highest grade. Uh, a lot of that, I think, from what I understand anyhow, is that there is to produce iron mounts for a gun is a lot more work 
than uh, cast mm -hmm. uh, brass mounts. Okay. And uh, can even be more work than making silver mounts. So uh, iron was often considered uh, one of the highest uh, highest grades of uh, hardware you could have on a weapon. Whereas here, it was often the common man's gun. Right. And in most cases, you know, occasionally you'll see one that's got a nice, uh, uh, more ornate uh, four-piece iron patch box on it. But typically, they're simpler guns. And uh, that appeals to me, too. Uh, I guess just because of who I am and, and, and uh, uh, you know, just the, the simplicity of them and the fact that they were used. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's always appealed to me. And I guess as a builder, um, I just enjoy the process so much of forging as many of these parts as I can do. Um, it's it, to me, I, I, wouldn't be as excited about building rifles if I was using cast mounts all the time. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not what I'm in it for. Yeah. You get to be a lot more hands-on with it. Yeah. Yeah. And design it right from, you know, not that you can't with brass, you can make your own masters if you're going to do your own casting. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. But, you know, I just, I just, that whole part of the process is real important to me. Yeah. So what's your, what's your shop look like? Are you fairly, are you modernized with, you know, kind of a gas forge and maybe some machinery? Or are you, are you still pretty traditional even with your, with the tools that you're using? Oh, it's somewhere in between. Okay. I mean, I've got electricity um, and I've got, I'm looking around here. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I've got drills. I've got a little lathe for, I make, uh, if I've got to make screws or a tumbler for a lock, I've got an, a little lathe that I can use and a bench grinder. And, uh, then I've got a pile of hand tools, uh, as far as the forge, I've got a coal forge that's out in the yard under a tree. Still, we moved here about six years or so ago and I still haven't put a roof over it <laughs> so I'm at the mercy of the weather, but, yeah. um, but it works and the sun too, <laughs> and that'll, that'll ruin your day. If something took you a little longer than you thought it was to hammer out. Oh yeah. Especially if you're out there cooking. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you just try to ignore that. It's yeah. either it's Ohio. Well, it's got the same weather over there. You know, you're either you're either burning to death or your snot's freezing when it hits the anvil. Yep. <laughs> it's just part of the fun. Yeah. So are you out there foraging in the winter or are you trying to get your foraging done for the winter before it gets too cold? No, I just go out there and forge. Uh, I'm a green, I won't, but otherwise I just go out there and forge whatever I need um, whenever I need it. And, uh, I try to, um, I, I got a rivet forge at the, uh, well, some of the stuff finally broke and I'm right now I'm using a table forge that a good friend loaned me. And, uh, but still, if I'm doing uh, the one thing that I won't forge when the weather's real cold is, is, uh, larger blades. Like if you're trying to do a foot long blade, it's hard to heat treat it. Uh, you know, I don't have a furnace or anything. Oh yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard to get an even heat on a, on a large blade when it's 28 degrees out. So yeah, that really starts to mess with the metal then, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But other than that, I just forge any time. <laughs> well, you're a tougher man than me. I, I think I'd chicken out once it started snowing. <laughs> Nope, got bills to pay. So I'm looking at your, I've, I've, I've got an iPad set up here with your Instagram on it, just kind of browsing as you're talking. And it looks like yeah. you, you do several kind of collaborative projects. Um, we had yeah. Eric Ewing on earlier in the year and you've got a neat bag from him. Um, you did some, some work with Ken Gehagen here. It looks like what's it, what's it yeah. like working collaboratively with other, other artists and craftspeople? I mean, cause from what I know of, kind of muzzleloader and, and building history, um, you know, a lot of the original rifles were still collaborative. I mean, just because you built guns didn't mean you made locks or you made barrels. I mean, some right. people did everything, but um, you're still kind of continuing that tradition of, of collaboration. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and as far as projects like, uh, well, I've done, done a, a couple of bigger ones with people too, where, you know, 14, 15 people, that it's been just fantastic, but still, I mean, each individual gun that I do in, in a sense is a collaboration, like you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm generally getting my barrels from, from, 
somebody else. Uh, you usually use uh, rice barrels or ed rail barrels, uh, but they're, I mean, that's just, you know, cosmetic. They're doing the work and uh, the locks, I've not made, I've not made a complete lock yet. I can, I can make every piece on one. I've just not made a whole lock. So I'm getting my locks from, from other people. So every gun that I make is, is, is kind of a collaboration in that sense. But as far as um, uh, artistic collaborations, we'll say, uh, I've, I've done quite a few with other people and I really, really enjoy it. And they've all, they've all been good experiences. Um, there's, there's always a chance that, you know, you get a bunch of artists together that something's going to go wrong Yeah. Uh, to where people hate and want to kill each other. I've seen that happen before, but fortunately we haven't had that yet. <laughs> well, good. Yeah. But, uh, all that pot you were talking about with that, that uh, little set that I did with Eric. Yeah. Uh, that was really a lot of fun. Uh, I, I really, um, I really enjoy Eric's stuff. He's, he's, uh, he's good at coming up with stuff that you don't expect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I like and, about, about yeah. his work. He's always it's, it's, finding a way to use something I never would have thought of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've done, uh, uh, the, probably the, well, I'd, I'd done like, uh, like smaller scale collaborations. My, uh, Mary Ellen, my wife does leather work. Okay. And she'd been kind of out of it for a while. She's getting back into it here. Uh, recently, which is nice to see her working on some stuff again. But oh, a while back, she and I had done uh, a lot of uh, pouch sets together and, you know, kind of decided on sort of a theme or a feel for it and 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 worked together on that. And those were always a lot of fun. Um, and we came up with some some neat stuff. That's that's one of the coolest things about these collaborations. As long as you don't, in my estimation, if you don't have one person dictating what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, then you open it up to where it becomes a true collaboration. If you let everybody's ideas sort of meld, you let everybody's strengths sort of meld together. Yeah. And, uh, just, just had some, some great results when we've done, um, trying to think of what, oh, I won't be able to remember what year it was a few years ago. Uh, there was this bigger collaboration called the Southern traveler. Oh, and, cool. We went into it with, uh, um, I, you know, I had an initial idea and had a, had a customer who was very interested in it. And once we started talking about implementing it, it grew a little bit. And once I started talking with other artists, it kind of morphed into something not completely different, but so much, so much more than the initial idea was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure. I don't have any stuff posted on my Instagram for for that if you go uh look on art you, you, you've seen art and jan riser's blog spot yeah the contemporary makers yeah if you look there they have it on there kind of on a sidebar okay um but it was it was uh i'm trying to think i think that one was 14 people were involved in that one in, in making the stuff it was just a wonderful experience and uh we we came up with some neat stuff i mean really neat stuff uh, more recently, the, uh, uh, for the CLA auction, a bunch of us got together and did a project called the Warriors Clutch. Mm. Uh, uh, that, I'm not sure where to tell you to go look for that. Uh, Art and Jan may have that on their, their blog spot too. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, but I can, I can start posting. So I've got all the images and everything. I can start posting them myself too, for people who haven't seen it. Um, but that was, uh, that was a great project too. I just really thoroughly enjoyed working on that one. Um, it was, uh, there were a lot of kind of like mini collaboration, not many, but, uh, collaborations within the larger collaboration. We had, uh, uh, five of us worked on the gun. Okay. Me, Ken, Josh, Dave, and Brad. Yeah, that's five. Um, worked on the gun. It was like a, a composite gun with a, a painted stock. Okay. Uh, uh, Eric Ewing and Sean Webster worked on the pouch, which it was a lot of this stuff was kind of a, a really neat blend of uh, 
uh, native and European colonial stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the pouch kind of embodied that. It was sort of the style of the pouch was what you'd expect more. It was an open top pouch uh, that would typically, you know, be more of a native style. Uh, and uh, the fact that it was quill work uh, decorated uh, was was definitely native. But the design itself was inspired. Uh, the quill design was inspired by. Um, uh, painting, uh, vine painting on an English trade gun. Uh, so there's sort of a combination of both there. The body of the bag itself was uh, a mix of brain tan and bark tan. So there's, you know, your native and European stuff right next to one another. So that was a collaboration between those two guys, uh, powder horn and, and uh, strap, um, Alec Foreman and uh, Alec wove this, uh, you know, a finger woven strap. Tad Fry made a really nice horn, uh, a buffalo horn. And, uh, uh, oh, let's see who else. Oh, we had a, 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 a war club made by Matt Fenwald. It was uh, sort of a style, not sort of, styled um, uh, like Water Panther. Um, you know, a ball ball club with the ball in the yeah. panther's teeth. Um Oh, I guess adding to the gun, Gene McDonald made a strap strap for it. And then we had an effigy knife uh, made by uh, Joe Siebel and Sean Webster made a quilled pouch for it. Then <laughs> we took all this and uh, Ken and I made a, a base a display stand for it that was about eight feet tall uh, with a forged. It was a you know a wooden base painted with a, a forged iron display that everything kind of nested in and the whole thing was auctioned off as a, as a single art piece. Wow. So it was kind of like, uh, in a way it was almost like a still life with Flintlock, you yeah. know, it, was, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it turned out really cool. Um, I think it brought, it brought like almost 18,000 for the wow. CLA. Uh, but that was, that was a more recent collaboration. Yeah, Warriors Clutch. I just remembered Alec Foreman came up with that name. I think he and I were the first ones talking about it too. Um, in a phone conversation. Um, but anyway, that was that was one of the bigger collaborations. Uh, yeah, just really really enjoying it. I'm I'm looking forward to doing more of them. I've been talking with Josh kind of recently. Josh Wrightsman about mm -hmm. doing uh, uh, a gun together. Cool. And. Uh, yeah, looking, looking forward to that whenever it happens. Yeah. For a limited time, you can enter to win a 15-pack of Thor Bullets. That's a $30 to $34 value. Visit thorbullets.com slash NMLRA to fill out the form and enter to win. So how did you get started or get interested in history? Has it been there for a long time or is it something that came in when you were an adult? It, it's the opposite of what you're, <laughs> it's the opposite of your situation. <laughs> <laughs> Almost exact opposite. Um, when I was young, I was interested in things that were not very useful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I kind of got, um, in a way, steered onto a better path by uh, by the time I was in high school. Uh, I had a couple of shop teachers that that was ended up being one of the only things I enjoyed in school was was uh, having hands on being able to make stuff. And uh, I had a couple of shop teachers who I don't know if they saw that I was in trouble or, or what happened, but they both sat me down and said, hey, you want to come down here when you have a study hall? We've talked to your teacher, the study hall. Uh, teacher and and uh if you want you can come down here and work in the shop uh, when you're done eating lunch you can come down here and work in the shop so any free moment i had in school or anything i could call a free moment i would go down the wood shop metal shop and work and uh it it was uh i didn't really realize this how important that was to me until years later mm -hmm. and uh that it, it it definitely was very important to me, and uh, I don't know if either of those guys are still around. I bet they are, but um, I should probably try to find them and thank them. <laughs> Made that big of a difference to me. But yeah. anyway, um, so 
I, just kind of as an aside, it, it's 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 such a tragedy that 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 uh, the shop classes are seems like they're all but gone in schools now. Yeah, it's a real. I think it's a real issue myself. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, there's uh, a whole lot of people that I'm hearing from. Um, I don't want to pigeonhole people, but a whole lot of younger people that I hear from that are getting into this stuff. Uh, nobody ever taught them how to do, how to build stuff. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's, it's like it skipped a generation and, uh, boy, they want, boy, they want to know everything, you know? So it's, it's really, really rewarding to be able to pass along some stuff to people like that. Well, that's but great. Anyway. Yeah, oh yeah. It's, 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 it's reason enough alone to, to, uh, to teach. I mean, there's just a giant void there, you know? Yeah. But I think it's, it's encouraging too, that there are so many young people interested in it and seeking it out on their own. Absolutely. I mean, that's yeah. definitely a, a concern of the muzzleloading living history, traditional craft world is, you know, the aging population of it. Um, but there's so many young people now getting interested in it and they don't, know how to do anything, but they're using the internet and they're getting out there and they're asking, you know, professionals like you trying to figure out from the ground up how to do this stuff. I mean, yeah, um, they and, want to know. Yeah. I'm hoping it's, that they start kind of leveraging to get shop class back into school. I'm a, I'm a firm believer that human beings like to make things with our hands and it's, you know, it's really important for us to have touch and held something through a process to have it completed yeah. and, then, and then use it then down the road, even if it's just like a birdhouse. I mean, <laughs> that's so important. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, uh, well, yeah, you said it. <laughs> absolutely. I can't add much to that. Uh, anything, you know, something you can make in a, in an hour. I mean, some of them haven't even done something like that. Yeah. You know, it's just not what life has been. It hasn't been a part of their lives at all. And, uh, yeah, it's just fantastic to be able to, to be able to help them out and, and, uh, you know, not like I'm trying to steer them towards making guns. If that's what they want to do. Fantastic. But, uh, you know, just, just to see them learning about hand tools and seeing how they work, you know, it's like a whole new world for them. And it's, it's very cool. Yeah. But anyway, I'm getting side, I'm sidetracking us here. Uh, I, I got into, uh, history, uh, after I really, after I've, I've, you know, I've had somewhat of an interest in history, but you know, when it's presented to you as a school subject and you're a school hater, yeah, you know what I mean. Yep, <laughs> so, it's, it's hard to swallow. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it, it came later, mostly uh, much later, when I started building rifles and uh, suddenly realized, yeah, these came from somewhere. These are part of something larger than just the guns themselves, and and. Uh, you know, you kind of learn along with it when you're learning about the old rifles and old tools and old anything. And, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, my interest in history has developed much later in life. I wanted to tell you a dumb story. Oh, I'd love to hear it. It's a dumb, funny story. Well, I, I discovered, um, oh, just a couple of weeks ago, I discovered that I control the flow of electricity in our County with my right index finger. Really? How's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Because <laughs> if it just got quiet, then things were about to get really weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, I went I went over to the house. Uh, oh, it was early one morning, probably 6.30, 7 o'clock. And uh, went back into our utility room. Can't remember why. And went to turn the light switch on and power went out in the house. Like, <laughs> damn it, I broke the house. You know, and... <laughs> Well, I walked out the front door and we live half out in the sticks and I could hear down the road, the neighbor's generator had kicked on. So it's like, okay, it's not just it, us. I didn't break the house. The power's out. Uh -huh. So I came back out to the shop. I got plenty of windows. I can work and, and don't need the lights on. And probably a couple hours later, I was going to go in the house to get a drink and walked in the house and Mary Ellen had gone to work and closed all the curtains in the house to keep it cool and uh walked in and reached over to turn the lights on and right when i'm flicking the switch up it's like you dummy you know the power's off and click and the, all of a sudden all the power came back on <laughs> so <laughs> i control the power in adams county ohio with my right index finger 
<laughs> so you didn't get like I, a knock on the door from some electric company thugs or anything? <laughs> Uh, not yet, but I probably will now. No, I, I, I hope not. I hope that doesn't happen. We'll uh, we'll gargle your voice or something and, and say there was a special guest came on. <laughs> <laughs> Wish to remain you, anonymous. This is my evil twin. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a good power to have. Yeah. You well, know, you, I'm going to use, use it, it for good. Yeah, you use it justly. So, I mean, I think that's half the battle right there. Yeah. So what would you recommend? I mean, we talked a little bit there about younger people getting interested in this. I'm 26, so I'm definitely in that classification as young person. You know, what would you recommend to anybody listening that knows somebody that's interested in this or might be it or might themselves be interested in it? Where should they start to go, you know, learn about kind of the kind of stuff that you're doing or that your contemporaries are doing? Oh, OK, because I was going to ask, I mean, what aspect of it? There's there's so much to it. You know, yeah. um, if if there was somebody who wanted to learn how to make some of these things, there's there are plenty of classes. Uh, it's not always an option for for people because they're not all cheap. Most right. of them aren't. Yeah. Uh, but for for uh, uh, for some people, it's a good fit. And uh, I remember the first class I went to, I was probably. Oh, I might've been 30, late twenties. I really can't remember, but you know, I, I, I saved up for it. You know, um, it was, it was, uh, something I really wanted to do, but some people are just not going to be able to do it. So, uh, a couple of these places, you kind of have to check into it, but we'll offer scholarships Okay. now it's, Oh, for example, the, the classes over here at Canner's cave, um, uh, uh, Ken Gahagan and I teach the, the gun class now that, that John and Herschel were teaching for years. Okay. And we have a scholarship uh, that, well, Jason Gatliff had been doing it for several years, uh, Muzzle Loader Magazine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know Jason. Um, He's a great guy. Yeah, he is. Uh, do you, uh, doing a youth uh, scholarship for the gun class, uh, which – uh, now has been combined uh, for a couple years, the Kentucky Rifle Association, uh, actually the, the KRF, Kentucky Rifle, uh, that branch of the KRA uh, had sponsored a similar scholarship. And starting this year, they're combining the two into one scholarship that pays full tuition, parts, money. They pretty much just have to show up with tools. Oh, great. Um, we're trying to get a similar one started for Herschel and John and Joe Siebold are doing the knife class over there. We're trying to get a similar uh, scholarship started for that. Uh, we have a, uh, a private donor has started a scholarship for the uh, leatherworking class that uh, Gene McDonald and my wife, Mary Ellen, uh, do the leatherworking class there. So there's a, a young person going to be able to attend that this year for free. Um, and I know one or two of the other places that do, that do classes have, uh, has scholarships also. So you just got to kind of check around. I don't think there's any one source you can go to, to get the information, but, um, just gotta, just gotta see who's got what, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot like, uh, hunting scholarships for college. You don't, you got to hunt around for it. <laughs> yeah, probably. But, uh, that's good though. I mean, that. That makes sure that the people that do get it, you know, are, are willing to put in the effort to find it and and go through the process. You know, that, that, yeah. that way, you know, you've got somebody serious about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've had uh, in the gun class we've had I'm trying to remember if it was five or six so far uh, that that, uh, that got scholarships that came through and they were all just just great great students, all different, but, uh, obviously all different people and some of them interested in it for different reasons, but they all really enjoyed the class, learned a lot. Um, it's, it's been, it's been really nice and I'm glad it's continuing too. It's, 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 it's pretty awesome that, that people are willing to, uh, to make it, make it available. Mm -hmm. So do you see yourself at all now that you're doing some of these classes, kind of filling the role that your shop teachers did for you? I don't know. Um, I guess in the sense that, yeah, passing on, passing on the skills. Most of the guys that are uh, coming to uh, 
uh, you know, into the scholarship program. And it has been guys so far. We've had uh, we've we've had a couple of uh, women in the classes, or several actually. Uh, so far, only one in the gun class. It'd be great for great to see more. Okay, well, um, we'll see what we can do about that. Yeah, yeah. But so far, uh, so far, they've all been just great people. You know. Not saying I wasn't a great people, <laughs> but yeah, not not complete, not completely fulfilling the same role. I guess to right. answer your question. So, do you do many kind of traveling shows where you go and set up somewhere, or do you kind of stick close to home? We've talked to kind of a variety of of craftspeople that do go out, and then others that don't. Um, we talked to Jim Kibler a little bit. I mean, he makes yeah. that line of kits, and and he said it's just it's not worth it for him right now. He likes going out and talking with people, but it's, it's time away from the shop. And I'm just curious about how, how you look at that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I used to do, go to more shows than I do now. I've, I've kind of paired it back. I really, I love going to the shows, but it is time away from the shop and it's an expense. Yeah. And, uh, it, it is important to, uh, um, to, to be able to, to meet with people and, and talk with them. I, you know, I've always, my whole life, I've always kind of kept to myself, but I've made more friends doing this stuff than I had ever before, you know? Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's nice to be able to, to, to get together with people, talk about them. Uh, there are people that are on, on the list to have, have me make things for them. It's nice. It's great to be able to talk with them face to face and talk about ideas, you know, uh, much better than just talking other ways. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's great. Uh, so I still go to some shows every year, but at the same time, shows can be kind of terrifying. There's, <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of people. I mean, in, in, in a day or two, I talk to more people than I talk to the whole rest of the year. Yeah. And, and, uh, um, yeah, it's a big spectacle. It's like, uh, like going to see going to see the fireworks and half of them start landing on your head by accident <laughs> starts to get a little too close a little bit yeah but but yeah i do I, I do a few typically i'll go to the cla show i always make it to that uh that tennessee show i was talking about um and then usually one or two of the others uh but i had been going to a bunch you know the first few years i was building guns and a, a lot of people uh, they just travel from one event to the next and, and do really well, you know, yeah. that's, um, they, they oftentimes, you know, they'll set up tents and they got a lot of stuff to sell. And uh, typically I, I don't, I, I work, uh, you know, somebody orders something from me and I make it for them and occasionally I'll have one or two things to sell, but yeah, you know, everybody's different. Yeah. Yeah. I th I've talked to a few people that are on the road, you know, close to 40 weekends out of the year. And I just can't imagine that <laughs> I, I've got to yeah. go in. I've got to go back home and kind of recharge and, and spend some quiet time out in the woods, just kind of recentering, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know you're not a, a numbers guy, but how many orders or how many guns do you typically take or build in a year? Boy, that varies a lot. Um, trying to remember the most I've made in a year. I know it was more than a dozen. That was closer to when I was getting started. I think I told somebody 15, told a couple of people 15 at a show and my wife gave me a funny look. It's like, okay, probably wasn't 15, <laughs> maybe 14, 13, something like that. More than a dozen, I know, uh, in a year. There's been years when I've only made three or four. Uh -huh. um, it just depends on what it is, how elaborate it is and what else I got going on. Um yeah, uh, it, it, some of them, some of them take me, might take a few months to work on and others you can get done in a few weeks, you yeah. know, so it really varies. I make all kinds different, you know, a lot of different kinds of things, but as far as, uh, uh, when people are calling me to order a gun, I know it, it's, it's extremely difficult for me to judge how long my waiting list is. I, I know I've got a, I know the number of people I've got on the waiting list for rifles and I don't know what we're going to make for most of them. Right. You know, if a few people have said, 
you know, I saw this one you made. I want something along those lines, you know, so I've got a got an idea of how long that's going to take. But in most cases, I don't even know what we're going to make until we get there. And the way I work anymore is um, I'll go I'll get a feel for how much stuff I might be making over the next eight months, 12 months. I'll call the next three or four or five, six, whatever people ahead and say, here's the kind of things I'm going to be making. And there's usually something in there that they're interested in that we can use for a starting point. Okay. And uh, so at this point, I'm, I mean, I've been telling people around six or seven years um, of a wait, but that's just my best estimate. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't really know. Well, it seems like a, a relaxed way to do it. And you're up front with people saying, hey, you're not going to get it next week. <laughs> yeah. But when you yeah. get it, you know, you'll be able to go through and, and make what they want. So I, I think that's neat. Yeah, it's it's yeah, where I'm at now has always been what I thought would be ideal to where people kind of recognize what I'm making. And, uh, you know, when I was getting started, a lot of, I was making a lot of everything. People mm -hmm. called me with what they liked that was out there already and uh, make me one of those. And I've kind of shifted now to where, like I said, people know what I do. And uh, it's it's certainly a lot easier in that respect. It can be frustrating when you get ideas and, and uh, people aren't interested in them. Right. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, it's 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 been really nice. It's a, it's a good place to be right now. Well, that's good. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. What kind of things do you do for fun when you aren't building or, or making knives? Same stuff. Same stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's funny. I've got uh, I've got a gun. I've, I've I've never owned a smoothbore. I've made a pile of them for people and never owned one. And I've got a barrel sitting here that. Uh, Oh, Jason Schneider sent me back in hey, April. That's for my gun. Oh, great. S sitting there next to a piece of wood, and I've been looking at it since then. Anytime I go to work on something for myself, it's like, well, if you're still awake, do something to make money. Yeah. You know? yep. And I uh, just, you know, it's hard to justify. But one day here, we've gotten kind of caught up with all these all these knives. And uh, one day here, I'll put that barrel in and work on it for a few days. It'll be a simple gun. I'll knock it out. But I enjoy uh, um, hunting is one of my favorite things, particularly deer hunting. Okay. Um, where I live, I mean, I can I can hunt right here, which is this is pretty awesome. Yeah, that's half the battle anymore. Yeah, exactly. So really fortunate there. Um, I love squirrel hunting, and I haven't been in a couple of years. I just I was too busy talk myself out of it and it's crazy i mean i could step out of the house and start killing squirrels you know so um well see that time I, that you spent away was just luring them into a false sense of security around your house that's what it is you know see now, don't ruin this for me they're listening <laughs> <laughs> they can hear us oh, okay i'll keep it down <laughs> yeah but i just i uh, i built this uh in fact the rifle that i built in in uh that class i went to with herschel and John over at Canner's Cave. I've never been happy with the metal finishing that I did on it. And I rushed into the engraving before I knew how to engrave, just engrave the lock and my name on the barrel, but just mm -hmm. kind of looked like garbage. And so just a few days ago, uh, I took that all apart and started redoing the metal finish, filed the engraving off, redid it. So I'll be, I'll be hunting in style this year. Wonderful. <laughs> and looking forward to it. Little 32 flint lock. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's about all you need for squirrels. Yeah, I like 32. Everybody's got their favorites. But yeah. I've, I've, I've always liked, I've hunted them with uh, 32, 36. And I, I borrowed somebody else's a uh, small caliber. I can't remember what it was, 25, 29, something like that. And I like 32 best. What do you hunt deer with? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a 60 caliber rifle. That is way overkill for white-tailed deer. <laughs> I mean, it works. It yeah. works well. Uh, you don't need it. Uh, I had I had hunted for years with a forty-five rifle, and uh, I built oh, in a span of probably a couple of years, I built several bigger bore, you know, uh, sixty, sixty-two caliber rifles for a few people, and they're just so much fun to shoot. 
you know, before that I'd done, you know, 54s, 58s, and anything bigger was smooth bore. Mm -hmm. And uh, just got real enamored with these big bore rifles and, and built myself a 60. And uh, found out after the first first couple times I took it out, yeah, you don't need you don't need to load it up very much. <laughs> yeah, that just yeah. about puts them down looking at them. Yeah, yeah, it's sovereign, as they say, it works. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I hunt with about, uh, depending where I am, if I got how long a shot, I think I might have it, it, you know, about 70 grains of two F powder and, uh, 80 when I went to a place that had bigger woods a couple of times and mm -hmm. it worked fine. I, I, I took a big, nice size buck last year, a little over 80 yards. Uh, and I think I had it loaded with 80 grains that time. And yeah, it's no trouble other than having to drag it out of a ravine that I thought it looked like it went skiing. Oh, jeez! Shot it right up at the head of a ravine up at the top and down it went. It just kept going. I thought, surely it's going to hit that tree and stop. Nope. Kept going, kept going. <laughs> it was like, wow, this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Dragging it out of there. That sounds about how it'd work if I went out hunting <laughs> right now. Yeah. 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 So what are you working on today? What do you, you said you kind of had something finishing up you had a stopping point. I'm just curious. Oh, I had forged out a uh, a guard for this bigger knife, uh, the one I was telling you about for the, the, the guy in New York. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I had uh, uh, forged a guard the other day when I was doing a couple other things out there and, and uh, I just had it fitted and just needed to file it out. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's probably about the most elaborate knife I've made. Uh, it's got some nice, uh, well, I haven't cut them out yet, but some sort of brass panels sort of started out in a way sort of inspired by some of the Spanish knives, uh, brass panel back at the hilt and, and sort of this one sort of flows, runs up the spine a bit and uh, sort of surrounds some engraving um, and bone handles, a little bit of carving on, on the handles, just a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's. Uh, that's the one that's been tormenting me for a few weeks. <laughs> I was designing the engraving, just had a, just had a hell of a time with it. And, uh, finally I had to leave it, you know, leave it alone. I was spending days and nights working on it and racing it, starting over. And just one of those things, sometimes the stuff flows and sometimes you're fighting it, you know? Yeah. So I had to leave it alone for a, a few days and come back to it. And what usually happens if I get something like that, you know, you come back to it and the, the problem sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. You, know, you were just missing it because, because you were missing it. Yep. But yeah, so I had to redo part of it and the rest of it was already good, thankfully. So I didn't have to completely start over, but yeah, it'll be nice, nice to get this one finished and see what it actually looks like. I, I got in my head what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> well, hopefully it gets there. Yeah. And after that one's done, I got one more, one more knife. It's like a um, going to look like a rehandled cartouche knife. Like that whole fancy handle is gone, and somebody's put a different different handle scales okay. on it. And uh, then on to the next rifle, which is going to be a pretty wild one. Very cool. What what kind of rifle? It is. Uh, this is a fun one. It's it's going to be. At first glance, you might think Southern by some of the attributes, details, but the more you look, it can't be. So, um, it's it's designed specifically as a thought provoker for anybody who's uh, um, uh, like like one of these old guns that turns up that causes arguments. Okay. About where it's from, um, I'm kind of designing that into this one. Hopefully, there's no fist fights at the shows over it. <laughs> Maybe it would be good if there were. Kind of spice it up a little bit. Controversy. Yeah. <laughs> Controversy at the show. But um, oh, it's 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 neat to uh, well, like with that Southern Traveler set I was talking about. There was some controversy there about some of the items. Um, there were some people making assumptions. It was called the Southern Traveler, and we had some Great Lakes inspired quill work on some of the pieces. And there was kind of a minor hubbub about it, and uh, there didn't need to be. I mean, this, the, the idea uh, behind it was this person was a traveler, uh -huh. and we were also sort of exploring possibilities for 
um, uh, you know, there were these long established uh, native trade routes. Yeah. And uh, we know that they traded uh, uh, among themselves. Uh, oh, anything, you know, obsidian, porcupine quills, you know, areas that, that there weren't porcupines, quill work shows up. Uh, but anyway, there were so there was this apparently a group of people who were very offended by the Great Lakes uh, style quill work that showed up. It's like, well, there's a reason for it. You mm. know, that's the whole idea. Yeah. You've got to kind of think into this. You know, none of these things. You had a big a big mix of, of uh, some things that would have been made colonial d- domestically, some a few things that would have been imported from Europe, uh, things that have been used already and repurposed into something else. Native, obvious native objects. You know, I mean, it was just a neat, neat mix of stuff. And it was, I mean, that was the idea was to try to, uh, apart from create something that was really nice to look at in a, in a neat set, we wanted to kind of provoke thought with it too. Yeah. So I guess it worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't thank you enough, Ian. I'll, I'll be in touch some more and, and maybe we can do this again sometime. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. If I if I can make it to the to Mel Hankless show here in Ohio, I'll I'll be sure to to look you up and Yeah, definitely do. Man, I hope you can. I'm I'm excited. Um Wayne Estes has been emailing me about that saying I need to get down there. I was <laughs> filming the the class with him and Mike Brooks there at Friendship oh, just okay. a couple of weeks ago and Yeah. Spent a lot of time with those guys and they were saying, "Oh, you need to you should talk to Ian Pratt. And you got to come to this show and this show." And <laughs> so it's got me kind of kind of re-energized after kind of a rough summer here with COVID. Yeah, no kidding. We'd like to thank Ian once again for coming on the show. Ian took some time out of his day working in the shop to sit down and talk with us, and um, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I'm looking forward to meeting up with Ian here at one of the fall shows that are still going on if we can. You can check out Ian's work on Instagram. He goes by the name of iPrat360. We'll have a link down to his profile in the show notes below, as well as on the blog post and in the description of the YouTube video to go along with the episode. If you enjoy gun making or accoutrement making at all, be sure to check out the NMLRA YouTube channel. I've been working on a series of videos from our Kibler Kit Assembly class with Mike Brooks and Wayne Estes. The class was five days, and we've got about a half hour of video from each day as Wayne and Mike go through the kit building process with each student. All the guns started out as kits, but it was really neat to see how the individual student inspiration and and thoughts on how their guns should should turn out really changed the same kits into their own personal guns. So if you're interested at all in in learning how to do any of this, be sure to check out those videos. We'll have links down in the show notes as well to the classes that Ian talked about. If you know a young person out there that's interested in doing any of this kind of work, please direct them to some of these scholarships. We'd love to see the history and the knowledge of all the traditional craftspeople like Ian, like the House Brothers, being passed on to the next generation so they can carry it into the future. We'll have links to that stuff down in the show notes as well. It's been a real bummer of a year without being able to have any shows or travel to any events. But if you're looking for items that you would have normally picked up during those shows, please visit NMLRA.org. We have two pages set up that kind of aggregate where you can shop from. Um, NMLRA.org slash shop small. We'll give you a full list of the NMLRA vendors that show up and demonstrate and sell their wares at our events. We've also got NMLRA.org slash advertisers set up, and that's going to have a full list of everybody who advertises on the podcast, in Muzzle Blast, on the videos. And these are people that care about what we're doing and care about our efforts to preserve and to pass on American history and traditional craft. So please, if you can support any of these businesses, large and small, let them know you came from us. That lets them know that we're getting the word out about them and that you guys are supporting what they're doing as well. You can join the NMLRA today at nmlra.org slash join. Your one-year membership is going to give you 12 months and 12 issues of Muzzle Blast magazine. You can get that delivered to you as an ebook or as a physical magazine mailed to your door. If you can't afford to do that right now, times are tough. We definitely, definitely understand that. Um, but if you can, please share the show with a friend. Uh, we've got links down in the show notes. You can pass those along on social media or text them or email them to a friend. And uh, by rating us on iTunes and Spotify, you really help us get out in front of more people that are interested in muzzleloading, living history, and traditional craft. 
And that's something that we can't thank you enough for is, is sharing the show and, and sharing what we're doing here at the NMLRA. Thanks so much for listening and we'll catch you next time.